I'm Jason Davidson with Space Systems Command. Today I have the honor of speaking with SSC Commander Lieutenant General Michael Gutline. Welcome, sir. Good morning, Jason. There's a lot to talk about, so let's just jump right in. Okay. You've said before that the U.S. military is the best in the world, but won't be for long. Can you talk about some of the challenges ahead for our country? Yes, I can, Jason. I, I appreciate that. Um, for the, the past uh, 50 plus years, we have uh, led the space race. Um, it started with our uh, ascent to the moon and has continued on since then. Uh, it is clear to us that uh, our way of fighting uh, is in and through space, the way we uh, integrate all of our weapon systems. And the adversary has been watching us for the past 30 years and has been slowly catching up. Uh, today, the, uh, the Chinese are actually launching more rockets than we're launching on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we still have more capability on orbit. Uh, we still have uh, more satellites on orbit than they do but they're rapidly catching up uh, to us today. And uh, at the pace that, they are gro that they're growing, they will outpace us within the next uh, decade. Speaking of adversaries, uh, how does China's space program compare to the U.S.? What are they doing better than us and what are they perhaps not doing so well? Uh, right now, I think the thing that they are doing is they have the, the, the fastest growing economy in the world. Uh, and they are translating that uh, fastest growing economy into their growth into the uh, space environment. Uh, they are rapidly uh, testing uh, and they're allowing their systems to fail in a, a uh, test, fail, test type approach and quickly catching up to us in the, in the amount of capability. Uh, today, without a shadow of a doubt, the United States has the lead. Uh, we can still uh, uh, protect and defend all of our assets on orbit and our capabilities here on, on Earth, uh, but the adversary is quickly catching up. What about Russia? Is that just mainly a disruptor for the U.S.? Russia is also a contender. Russia is very determined uh, uh, peer uh, in space. Uh, they've been with us uh, since day one. Uh, there was a, they were part of the, the race to the moon. The other thing that Russia's got going on right now is their partnership with China. They're working really, really close. They're partnering on uh, potential things like a, a base on the moon, uh, the next generation GPS, as an example. Uh, so uh, Russia is also a contender uh, in, in this threat space. We're also hearing the word resiliency a lot, specifically SSC resilient by 2026. What does resiliency look like in space and what is SSC doing to support that goal? That is a, that is a great question. So if you look at our traditional systems, our systems were built for a uncontested uh, in an uncongested environment. Uh, they never had to worry about how they're gonna protect and defend themselves. Uh, they never had to worry about uh, potential collisions with other satellites because it just wasn't that, that uh, congested up there. So as we go forward, our satellites have become more resilient. And by resilient, it, it can't just harden the satellite and expect the, the satellite to stay up there and defend itself. I have to go through proliferation, uh, which means get more satellites up there. Uh, I have to do disaggrega disaggregation, which means instead of trying to cram all of our capabilities on one satellite, like we used to do because they were so expensive, we actually start disaggregating those capabilities to other satellites. That allows us to get some level of resiliency uh, uh, through uh, proliferation and through disaggregation. Disaggreg the other way that we're going to get resiliency on orbit is by uh, our partnerships. It'll be our partnerships not only with uh, other government agencies, but our partnerships with uh, industry, our partnerships with academia, and our partnerships with allies. By disaggregating our capabilities across our partnerships, we also start to get some uh, additional level of resiliency. And finally, we start gather gathering resiliency by uh, redundancy of our systems, but also by integrating at, at the uh, data levels so that I'm not just, re just reliant on one data source. I have multiple data sources I can go and start to integrate to get after the capability. So regarding satellite systems, back when space was a benign environment, it could take 10 years or more to design, develop, and field satellite systems. But now with space rapidly evolving and becoming more of a congested and contested warfighting domain, uh, can you tell us more about what SSC is doing to adapt to this new environment? That's a great question, Jason. Uh, if you look at the, the history of, of our satellites and why they were uh, taking so long to develop and why they were so expensive, was the cost of launch was expensive. It could cost you in, in, or in, in excess of $350 million per launch just to launch one satellite. In addition to that, uh, because it cost so much to launch, we started to aggregate a lot of our capabilities on, the, on, the, on board one satellite. The more and more I put on one satellite, the more expensive that satellite becomes. The more expensive that satellite becomes, the less of them I can buy, first of all, but also the more dependent I become on that one asset uh, going forward. So we end up paying a lot of money for mission assurance to guarantee that, that that one very, very expensive satellite on that one very, very expensive rocket actually was going to guarantee to get there on orbit and take the capability forward. So what has happened over time is we've driven the cost, actually through commercial uh, 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 partnerships, have driven the cost of launch way down. 
that, is a, that has allowed us to put more satellites on orbit. Uh, in addition to that, technology has progressed to a point where I don't necessarily have to put as much technology on every sing single satellite and it doesn't cost as much, which has driven the cost of the satellites down. So by driving the cost of launch down and driving the cost of the satellites down, we can now start proliferating uh, more satellites up there in different orbits and start connecting them in unique and opportune ways. So from a Space Systems Command, what we have done is really started to embrace that disaggregation and start looking at uh, our capabilities from a system to systems capability and understanding what does the warfighter really need and how can I best provide that capability without having to put all my eggs in one basket, if you will, on one satellite that's very, very expensive. System of systems integration is a new term for many people. Uh, what does it mean for SSC and the U.S. Space Force? So for, for SSC, system of systems integration is really doing that horizontal integration across multiple platforms. Uh, in the past, like I said, we'd had uh, very expensive satellites and we spent a lot of time integrating vertically through that satellite, making sure that the comm system worked, the repulsion system worked, that the payload uh, made it to the, the spacecraft okay, then the spacecraft made it to the rocket. We spent a lot of time on mission assurance and on those interfaces and that vertical integration to deliver a very exquisite capability on orbit uh, with one platform. Uh, stepping back, as we start to go through proliferation, disaggregation, and uh, our partnerships, it becomes very important that we start to integrate not only across different uh, platforms, so just think of uh, integrating GPS into MILSATCOM and integrating uh, missile warning uh, into GPS. Uh, not only do we need to do that, but now we need to integrate with our, our industry partners who are providing a lot of space ser services uh, and our, in our uh, allied partners who are, who are providing other capabilities. So the systems, the systems integration concept is really integrating across those disparate platforms and different partnerships to make sure that the capability that we deliver is going to be survivable and it's going to be something that the warfighter actually needs. So it sounds like integration is going to be a big part of SSC in the future and in fact you just rolled out a new organizational structure. Can you talk about some of the details of this new realignment? Yes, under the, under the realignment, so we now have uh, five PEOs. Uh, those five PEOs report directly to the service acquisition executive. Uh, within uh, that reporting chain under the Secretary of the Air Force, uh, I do not have any PEO authorities nor program management responsibility. However, I do have system and systems integration responsibility. So it is my job working for the service acquisition executive to integrate across those five PEOs to ensure that the systems that we are delivering are going to be uh, uh, integrated into an enterprise approach. Uh, not only that, but we are also the secretariat for uh, an organization that actually brings in all the other program offices like the Space Development Agency, the Missile Defense Agency, and the National Reconnaissance Office to also integrate them into the, the enterprise to make sure we're getting after a system of systems integration uh, approach. Uh, that new office that we stood up for uh, system of systems integration is under Dac Dr. Claire Leon. Uh, she is an amazing uh, leader that uh, we are going to uh, uh, be relying on heavily to make sure that as we deliver all of our capabilities that they're going to be effective, they're going to be time relevant, and they're going to be well integrated. For people listening who may not know much about SSC, it was stood up in the summer of 2021 to, among many things, develop and deliver space capabilities. Uh, can you talk about how this realignment will better support those efforts? Yes, so uh, as you said, uh, Space Systems Command stood up in August of uh, 2021, so we're just about six months old. Uh, our number one uh, objective at standing up uh, Space Systems Command was to get a warfighter focus. Uh, everything we do uh, has a purpose and has a need on the battlefield. Uh, so not only get to make sure we have a warfighter focus, but then guarantee that we are going to provide those services in a contested environment and that the operators can absolutely defend, depend on every capability that we're going to deliver. Uh, the next thing that uh, Space Systems Command was stood up to do was get unity of effort. And I bring up uh, unity of effort uh, because it's kind of, a co uh, kind of a foreign term for us in the military. We really understand really well what unity of command is. That means I can look up above me and I can immediately understand who's in charge. Uh, unity of command is a little tougher because nobody's in charge. The reason we need unity of command is there are multiple organizations developing space capabilities that go across organizational boundaries. Space Development Agency reports to the, the OSD r &E. Uh, missile Defense Agency reports to the Director of the Missile Defense Agency. Um, uh, Space RCO reports to the CSO, as an example. No single individual has oversight over all of those different acquisition organizations, so we needed to achieve unity of effort in order to get after the system of systems integration concept. So that's what uh, SSC's fourth function was, was to get unity of effort and system of systems integration. I understand that U.S. Space Command is working with its partners and allies 
uh, to develop a set of standards for acceptable behavior in space. And many countries, including the U.S., are uh, coming up with contingencies for what to do when those satellites are no longer operational. Uh, where do you think the solution for space debris will come from? Will it be kind of a, a commercial business as a service, or will the U.S. government with the Space Force be involved in removing space debris? That, that is a, that is a great, uh, very great question. So what we're really talking about here is norms of behavior in space. Uh, we have norms of behavior uh, in every other domain, but we don't have norms of behavior today in space. Uh, to give you an example, how close can I operate next to an adversary satellite or to a partner satellite or to a commercial satellite? Uh, what is that standard? Uh, we are currently working through uh, with our international partners trying to understand what that standard is. Uh, one of the standards is how much debris and, and, and uh, uh, debris removal can we have on orbit. Uh, uh, it, it's very, very dangerous to have it. The, the, some of that debris is traveling at 17,000 miles an hour, and you can just imagine the, of a BB, the size of, of, of debris the size of a BB, slamming into a satellite would be catastrophic. Think about that same BB slamming into the, United, the uh, International Space Station would also be catastrophic and probably loss of life. So it is to all of our benefit, to the world, to, uh, to A, limit the amount of debris that we leave in orbit, but also try to do uh, debris removal. If we ever get to a point where it is profitable for a commercial company to do debris removal, then it doesn't need to be a government function. Uh, until that happens, however, uh, industry is not going to just spend their own dollars to go up there and do debris removal. Uh, the governments of the world are going to have to incentivize them to do that, which means it's going to have to be a service, fee-for-service kind of approach. Uh, so we're currently in those kind of dialogues uh, with our international partners, uh, not only on how to limit the amount of debris that we leave, leave up there, but also to remove the debris that is up there. We see a lot of organizations and national efforts uh, encouraging STEM careers and creating greater inroads and opportunities for underserved uh, students and demographics. Uh, how will the Space Force and SSC bring the kind of highly trained individuals that it needs in order to stay ahead of the threat? That is a great question and it's been a constant challenge for us. Uh, we are seeing a, a, an enormous amount of innovation coming out of industry and a renewed sense of space that we have not seen since the push to the moon. Uh, that renewed sense of, uh, of uh, mission and that uh, 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 innovation from industry is causing a huge demand for STEM talent across the nation. Uh, that we're all trying to trying to uh, compete for. Going forward, in order for us to remain competitive in the space environment and competitive as a technological nation, we're going to have to continue to grow our STEM population. Um, we do that at SSC in many different ways. Uh, we have uh, uh, outreach starting in uh, elementary to try to get kids inter energized into STEM, uh, try to mentor them in STEM. Uh, we do the same thing at, uh, at the university level. Uh, matter of fact, I'm headed over to the University of Southern California uh, this afternoon to sign a partnership agreement that we're going to continue to cooperate uh, uh, in uh, building additional uh, uh, STEM leaders uh, going forward. Um, but I also want to back up and talk about the Space Force is greater than just STEM. We have many non-technical career fields. So anybody that's interested in space uh, that, that wants to, to participate, we would love to take them uh, regardless of their career or their, their, their degree. It doesn't have to be a STEM degree. Uh, we have uh, public affairs, uh, we have uh, contracting officers, financial officers, intelligence analysts, uh, all uh, are, are part of our team for the Space Force. In the two years since the U.S. Space Force was established, it's had to educate the American people um, on just how much the nation's economy and national security interests are tied to space. What is one thing that you think the general public might not fully understand yet about the importance of space? I don't believe the general public understands just how integrated space is into their day-to-day -day life. Uh, if you just look at just purely GPS, the global uh, positioning system, everybody knows that it gets us from point A to point B and it's on our dash and our cars and it's on our cell phones. But what they probably don't understand is it drives our banking network, it drives our economy, it drives the logistics. So without uh, having uh, GPS, uh, we would not be able to get the milk delivered in the grocery stores, uh, the, the, the food on the shelves. We would not be able to unload the ships out at sea. Uh, in addition to that, GPS drives our entire infrastructure. So our power grid, our gas, all of that's driven by GPS. A, ba a bad day in space, a day without space, the entire economy would come to a halt because we couldn't move data, we couldn't move people, and we couldn't move goods. Before we wrap it up today, sir, what is one final thought you'd like to share with our viewers today? I think the biggest thing I need our viewers to understand is that we really have moved into space as a contested environment. 
uh, the adversary has not only proven determined to prevent our use of space for peace and defense, but they've also proven extremely capable of doing that. Uh, just last month, the Russians launched a direct ascent ASAT. That's basically launching a missile into space and destroyed one of their own satellites. When they did that, they created 1,500 pieces of debris in a very unprofessional uh, uh, move. Those 1,500 pieces of debris are still up there, but worse yet, they caused the International Space Station to go into their escape capsules because they were afraid they were going to get hit with debris. And there were two cosmonauts in that International Space Station as well. So not only has the adversary proven capable, they've proven the intent, but they've also proven that they're willing to do it in a very unprofessional and unsafe way as well. Well, thank you very much for your time today, sir. I really appreciate you coming down. Thanks, Jason. Thank appreciate you. it. Have a great day. You too. Thank you.